25 men. The 1979 Cincinnati Reds, the National League Western Division champion. Brought to you by Utapol Beer and by Partridge Meats. Get set for the excitement of Cincinnati Reds baseball. Here's a line drive caught by Ray Knight, and this one belongs to the Reds. Frank Pastore hurls a four-hit shutout tonight as the Cincinnati Reds drop the magic number to one. For the 1970s ended as they had begun for the Cincinnati Reds. They were champions. The traditional champagne celebration truly belonged to everybody. But the moment didn't come easily, and the 1979 story had its beginnings back in November of 78 when a new leader was introduced. This came as a total and complete surprise and uh, I'm flabbergasted to have a, such an opportunity as, as this. The past two years have been good ones by the standards of most teams, but we are determined to set a higher standard. It is our decision that the move we make is in the overall best interest of making the Cincinnati Reds a better team. We feel John McNamara offers outstanding ability and strong major league experience. He's the man to take us in a new direction. John McNamara said in spring training that he would be his own man. He said he planned to involve all 25 players. Bill, we have to go on past performance and reports, and uh, what we want to see is some of the players that we really don't know, and, uh, and uh, quite a few of them I've never seen perform before, and some of our evaluation, but basically you go with past performance and reports, and then add what we see here in spring training, all lump it into one thing and come out with our evaluations and our answers. New pitching coach Bill Fisher's top priority was the development of young pitchers, like Tom Hume, and Mike Lacoste. They would have to join veterans like Tom Seaver and Bill Bonham if the Reds were going to win in 1979. The Reds had a gap to fill at third base. Pete Rose had elected to leave in the free agent draft. Deep down, I guess I wish the Cincinnati Reds would win the Western Division so I could play them in the playoffs if we win the Eastern Division, which I think we can. No one worked harder to get ready for the season than new third baseman Ray Knight. He even built a batting cage in the backyard of his Albany, Georgia home. Opening day in Cincinnati, 52,000 fans, another sellout crowd, and a brand new AstroTurf field to greet the start of the 79 season. Ken Griffey moved into the leadoff spot and found the new role to his liking. But opening day was a day to forget for the Reds. They committed five errors, and Tom Seaver lost his first opener ever. John McNamara and his band were on a kind of roller coaster in the first months of the season. There were highs like game-winning hits by Joe Morgan. and Grand Slam home runs by Dave Concepcion. And another by George Foster. But there were lows too. A nagging lower back injury bothered Tom Seaver till early June, and the rest of the staff had to pick up the slack. Bill Bonham's start was understandably slow as he worked his way back from off-season surgery. But despite some problems, the Reds battled hard, and they took the early lead in the National League West. Ken Griffey was off to a blazing start. He was the league's top hitter for the first month of the season. Mike Lacoste won his first eight decisions.
Cesar Geronimo triggered a 17-run uprising against the Astros. Frank Pastore posted four saves in his first month in the majors. Dave Concepcion was swinging a smoking bat. In mid-May, he was among the league leaders with a 345 batting average. In Pittsburgh, the roller coaster dipped a bit. An obvious check swing wasn't called, and the loss to the rival Pirates was frustrating. Newcomer Paul Blair's first hit in a Reds uniform packed a lot of punch. On the mound, Mike Lacoste filled a big role. With Seaver and Bonham ailing, he pitched brilliantly. Lacoste won 13 of his first 14 and earned a berth on the National League All-Star team. In Houston, the roller coaster dipped again. The Reds dropped three straight in late May. When they left the dome, they had fallen out of first place. The coaster climbed in June. Tom Seaver was back in form, and he three hit the Expos. Concepcion flexed his muscles and even surprised himself with a red seat home run. Davey didn't know it was a red seater till Tommy Hume told him in the dugout. Morgan demonstrated his home run power against the Pirates. But in late June, the roller coaster dipped once more, again in Houston. The upstart Astros took two out of three. And when the Reds left town, they were six and a half games behind. Even George Foster's 1,000th career hit couldn't turn things around. And the loss to the Giants dropped the Reds farther back. Frustration built and tempers erupted. First against the Dodgers. And then with new rival Houston. When the dust settled, the Reds were 10 games back. It was the 4th of July, and some people were counting the Reds out. Well, maybe some people were, but not everyone. Dick Wagner announced a new contract for John McNamara. As the second half of the season got underway, the Reds had their backs to the wall. If 25 men were going to make it happen, the time was now. And dramatically, things did start to happen. Dave Concepcion sparkled. At the plate. And in the field. Kennedy was a strong replacement for the injured Joe Morgan. Bill Bonham was back. He posted his first complete game of the year against the Cubs. 
In late July, Mario Soto struck out five Pirates in six innings. Some later called the win a turning point in the season. Tommy Hume developed into a new ace in the bullpen. He led the club in saves, and in one 33-inning stretch, he gave up just one earned run. Ken Griffey kept the attack in high gear. Soon, he'd be sidelined with a season-ending knee injury, but his 316 average would be third best on the club. With Griffey out 66 games and George Foster missing 40, others emerged in the Reds' second-half drive. First, Dave Collins, with his bat, his play in the field, and his speed on the bases. Then newcomer Hector Cruz stepped in. He batted 344 in August, and four of his hits were game-winning RBIs. He showed his talents in the field, too. Johnny Bench was having one of his best years. In late August, the Reds' all-time RBI man became the Reds' all-time home run hitter with number 325. Four days later, Tom Seaver stretched his win string to 11, longest by a Reds pitcher in more than 20 years. The Reds were rolling now. Doug Bear's 16th save gave the team its eighth straight victory. Things were coming together. All 25 men were playing their part. Fred Norman, Dan Dreesen, Cesar Geronimo, Vic Carell, Harry Spillman. Rick Auerbach. Manny Sarmiento. Sam Mejia. Ron Oster. Dave Tomlin, who was strong in the stretch drive. Paul Mosco. And Charlie Liebrand. All 25 did their share. Now it was time for a September showdown with Houston at Riverfront Stadium as the Reds fought to climb past the division-leading Astros. Heads up base running, advanced runners. It was an exciting ball game from start to finish. Back-to-back -back home runs put the Reds on top. First, Dave Concepcion. Then George Foster. As the Reds moved back into first place for the first time in three months. The next night, it was the clutch hitting of Ray Knight. And Dave Collins. Each had three hits, and the Reds built a 7-4 lead. When Cesar Geronimo made the catch of the year to end the ballgame, the Reds led the West by one and a half. The pennant race was Reds hot. 
A few days later in L.A., Dave Collins kept the Reds rolling. So did Dan Friesen. And reliever Mario Soto. And as the Reds headed to Houston for a big confrontation with the Astros, they sought to maintain their slim half-game lead in the NL West. Young Frank Pastore got the call in the game of his life, and he responded brilliantly. George Foster got things going with a second-inning home run. Pastore drove in another run with a single to right, and Ray Knight's aggressive slide jarred the ball loose from the Houston catcher. Collins' bat produced more Reds' firepower. And in perhaps the biggest game of the season, the Reds emerged with a 7-1 win, and they headed home to Cincinnati with a game-and-a-half lead. The Reds were in the driver's seat now. Five days later, as the season reached its final weekend, Frank Pastore was on the mound once again. He dazzled the Braves on a four-hitter. And when the Astros lost later that night to the Dodgers, the Reds were the National League's Western Division champions. to the National League playoffs and a confrontation with the powerful Pittsburgh Pirates, a team the Reds had whipped eight out of 12 times during the regular season. Capacity crowds were treated to great baseball. Games one and two were thrillers from start to finish. Both went extra innings and fans were on the edge of their seats all night long. There were plenty of Reds big moments, like a George Foster home run in game one. But the play Reds fans will remember most from the 79 playoffs was the catch that wasn't in game two. Television confirmed that umpire Frank Foley had missed the call on Dave Collins' diving catch. The Reds argued, but to no avail. The Reds battled back. A Collins double scored Hector Cruz. But the Pirates went on to win and go two games up. The scene shifted to Pittsburgh for game three. The Pirates took an early lead, and Willie Stargell lengthened the margin. It would have been a storybook ending to an incredible year had the Reds gone on to win the National League pennant and the World Series. But it wasn't to be. While the outcome of the playoffs momentarily dampened spirits, 
the passing of time more clearly brought into focus the scenario of 1979. It had been an extraordinary year. Skeptics had written the Reds off before the season started. But soon, fans learned what Reds principal owner Lou Nippert, Reds president Dick Wagner, and other faithful believed from the beginning, that the Reds would be winners in 1979 and close out one of the most remarkable decades any team had ever put together. Six division titles, four National League pennants, and two world championships. The Cincinnati Reds were the team of the 70s, and the exciting 79 Reds had given fans plenty of evidence that lots more fun and excitement was on the horizon for years to come. The Cincinnati Reds, baseball's team of the 70s. Record crowds poured into beautiful, modern Riverfront Stadium. A paid attendance of more than 22 million in 10 years. A record seven straight seasons above the 2.3 million mark. One of baseball's smallest cities became one of baseball's biggest draws. And the fans had plenty of action to entertain them. The stars of the 70s included four MVPs. Johnny Bench in 1970 and 1972. in 1973. Joe Morgan in 75 and in 76. And George Foster in 77. There were other honors too. Morgan and Foster were all-star game MVPs. Rose was the World Series MVP in 75 and Bench was the series MVP in 76. Big moments were a part of Reds baseball at Riverfront Stadium in the 70s. Pete Rose got his 3,000th hit, and later he put together a 44-game hitting streak. Tom Seaver pitched the Reds' first no-hitter in the stadium, a 1978 victory over the Cardinals. fans remember most about the 70s is the winning. The Reds won more games than any team in either league, and they won more championships. In 1970, they swept the Pirates in the playoffs to win the National League pennant. They played Baltimore in the World Series. still talk about umpire Ken Burkhardt's call at the plate in game one. Nineteen seventy two and that memorable game five of the playoffs against Pittsburgh. First Johnny Bench's dramatic ninth inning homer to tie the game. George Foster scores on a wild pitch. The Reds went on to extend Oakland to a full seven games in a great World Series. 1973, a Western Division Championship. And a memorable hard fought and bitter five game playoff series with the Mets. Reds fans didn't know it then, but a Met hero would become their own favorite a few years later. 1975, the Reds beat the Boston Red Sox in seven games. Many longtime baseball observers called it the greatest World Series of all time.
1976. The Reds swept the Phillies in the playoffs, and against New York in the series, Johnny Bench's bat boomed. The Yankees fell in four straight games. It was the first back-to-back -back World Series win by a National League team in more than 50 years. And 1979, the year 25 determined men won the West, closed the book on a great decade, and served notice that lots of excitement lies ahead in the 80s.